heard about one of them in the previous talk, which is this move towards um, kind of APIs and and um, separating the, the the front end experience from the back end. Um, and another one of these trends is 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 this move towards a more secure, kind of more privacy conscious um, uh, infrastructure um, across not just I guess the web, but um, but across almost all of the technology we use. Um, and and uh, that's why I, can't, I guess I'm kind of so excited um, about this next talk because um, there's kind of I suppose a, a, a one big challenge for these for these trends um, and and maybe one of the reasons they sometimes take so long to get going um, is that it, they're pretty complicated, right? It's, security is pretty complicated, APIs are complicated, Angular is complicated, um, and it can be kind of overwhelming um, to get into it. Um, and so that's why services like Let's Encrypt are so important, and talks like this um, are even more important. Um, and so I'm, I'm really, really excited um, to hand over to Sole, um, who's going to tell us all about securing WordPress with Let's Encrypt. Yes. <laughs> um, well, hi, I'm Sole, Soledad Penades. Um, Sole is fine. Um, I work at Mozilla. I generally do front end stuff, but as he said, with the new move to like HTTPS only um, APIs. You cannot do front end of the cool front end without secure websites. So I was like, okay, I need to find how to solve this thing out so I can do my cool stuff. Um, so I am feedbacking. Um, so I just don't know what's going on. Is that better? Okay, good. Um, okay, I've got remote, so I should be fine. Okay, anyway, yeah. So before I get started, I'm going to not assume that anyone knows about security because I didn't even know the most important things. So I'm going to try and explain everything very clearly because there are so many things that we assume that everyone knows that are not really clear at all. And it's important to understand what we can do and we cannot do with HTTPS. So the first thing I need to clarify is what do I mean with securing? And we can have secure transmissions, which is a secure transmission between servers and clients or between any machine at all. And then we also have secure systems, which is a system that cannot be broken because it doesn't have vulnerabilities or it doesn't have exploits or whatever. And in this particular talk, I'm just going to talk to you about secure transmissions because a secure system is like an entirely different world. And HTTPS only helps you with secure transmissions. So this is transmissions between servers and users, not between servers and servers. That's not cool. Um, so, and also we will try to make them as secure as we can make them because we cannot even be sure that what we do is totally safe. So the, the result of my investigation is that I'm super paranoid now and I hope at the end of this talk all of you are paranoid as well because this is horrible. Um, so yeah, HTTP, HTTPS, what are them? Um, so HTTP is the language between browsers and servers and please don't well actual me. I know it's not a language, it's a protocol, but I need to make things sh simple enough for this talk. So this is kind of like what t servers and browsers talk to each other. And then TLS is encryption protocol. So that's the S in the HTTPS. And TLS plus HTTP makes the HTTPS protocol or language or whatever you want to call it. So when you have an HTTPS, you have an encrypted connection between the browser and the server. And here's when we get really technical. Uh, so if you've done engineering, as I did, this might but if you haven't, I will really quickly explain this thing to you. Here's the internet. Um, this is cables, Wi-Fi, things. This is physical. The internet is when we start having IP addresses and ports, but here, they don't know anything about ports or IP addresses. This is just impulses, electricity, that kind of things. Here, transport. This is when things start to get interesting, some kind of meaning. And then finally, application. This is browsers, the things that we normally interact with. So with HTTP, um, here, uh, we are using TCP packets because we want things to be getting in order. You want to have your whole website show up in a normal, meaningful order. If we use these uh, UDP things, we might get things out of order so the website would not make any sense at all. So we're using TCP and the browser and the server are sending packets to each other. And they th say things like the browser goes to the server and says, get the index HTML to me. and then. The request is happening here in the transport, and the like get index HTML is being transported right like that down into the network. So if someone is 
here accessing or somehow having access to your network, they can see that you're requesting index.xml. Whereas if we go to HTTPS, we have this extra layer of encryption that kind of like wraps the older application layer and everything that goes in between this path, these bits, is encrypted. So even if they have access to the physical side, they cannot know what you're requesting. So it's cool, we are hiding things, but here's the caveat. The address and the port number are still visible. So they cannot know um, if you're requesting um, a certain page, they cannot read the cookies, but they can still know that you're connecting to a server. So this is interesting because if we were using Tor or something like that, we can hide that kind of things. But like for example, with the upcoming law that they're trying to pass, the Snooper Charter, they can still find which servers you're connecting, but they cannot know what kind of searches you're running in Google or whatever. So you have some privacy, but not all full privacy. So secure, but not that secure. If you are connected to something like makebombsreallyeasy.com, if the government wants to investigate, they may have some suspicions. Um, but if you're just connecting to Google, they don't know if you're looking for how to make a bomb or that kind of things, um, <laughs> educational things you might be interested in. Um, so yeah, with encryption, we have privacy and we also have data integrity, which is important because it means that whoever is reading your packets cannot also alter your packet, so it looks like something else. Um, so that's, that's interesting, but like, you, you need to remember that websites can still be malicious. Like even if something is secure, it doesn't mean that it cannot, they are not going to try and install malware in your computer. So a, a padlock in the URL address bar doesn't guarantee that a server is a good uh, person server. Um, um, so what kind of attacks um, am I talking about? So one of the most visible attack is inserting ads. Like for example, suppose you connect to a free public Wi-Fi and suddenly a website you used to visit, which is HTTP, has ads. And you're like, where did this, this thing came from? So this is the, the person who's providing the, the free Wi-Fi wants to get some money, so they insert ads to get some money out of there. And a slightly better way is like replacing existing ads with their own, <laughs> so they get the money that you will get, and you don't even notice that they, like if the website usually, usually has ads, and then you see slightly different ads, you're like, oh, whatever, it's still ads, so you just kind of like become oblivious to that. Um, you can also get like behavioral tra tracking, but not even telling people that this is happening, so that's kind of like gross. This is like getting grosser as I progress. Also, you can still use as credentials, so for example, your bank, credentials and then you go and log in after a person is logged in and then you just like tell or oh, give all the money to this other person and even probably worse is using the authenticated areas as a, an, a vector for elevating um, uh, for, for even grosser attacks um, this might be the case because <laughs> this is an issue with engineers we kind of like trust that people that have credentials to our, to our system are good people, and they, we, um, then we kind of like reduce the security requirements for those areas, like yeah, people with a passport are good people, they should be authorized personnel, whatever. Um, so we, uh, we put less checks in place, and someone who's trying to break into your system can steal your credentials and then log in and do worse things. So, yeah, paranoia. <laughs> and also, how does this happen? Um, so, some years ago, this wasn't that um, feasible because everyone was using wire networks. But nowadays, we have mobile phones, we have laptops. There is very few people that are using wire connections. So, public Wi-Fi access points. Next time you connect to one of those, <laughs> you should think twice because um, I could go to Trafalgar Square and start up a access point that has a captive portal and say, and name my Wi-Fi public Wi-Fi, and I'm pretty sure that 100 tourists are going to try and connect. And if I tr trick them into saying, log in with Facebook to connect to this free Wi-Fi, they are going to enter their details, even if there is no encryption or there is anything. So this is the kind of things that we are computer savvy and we know not to do, but most of the people don't know. So it's so easy to steal credentials. Um, also, access points that use uh, WEP, those can brute force hacked, so you can find the password in a couple of minutes. Um, also, default router passwords. <laughs> like, I think it's in Spain, it's so common that router passwords have like default passwords. You could just go and say admin, admin, and you would just be in, and you could just change the settings and everything. So you could just like be in a block of buildings and start trying to guess uh, passwords. Also, there were even apps for Android phones, so you could just like find the password for this. Um, 
uh, router by using the name of the network, you could detect the password. Um, so that's, that's bad, but <laughs> what's even worse is that even network providers try to make money out of their users. So for example, Verizon was modifying mobile data so they could insert ads in the transmission of their users. BT was inserting ads in our traffic because they thought that we would appreciate having targeted ads based on our, um, like in them tracking up what we were doing without even ask and you couldn't even opt out. And they call it web wise because obviously we need some wisdom. Um, and even it has been shown that some network operators are able to insert ads and kind of like in a very strange way by using kind of like a glitch in the TCP protocol, like they send a packet which is duplicated, but they kind of like hope that sometimes you might get the ad, sometimes you might not, because it's kind of like legitimate packets. So it it's using um, a property of the protocol to kind of like be faster, not faster. It's, it's a very kind of like tricky thing to do. Um, but anyway, whoever controls the pipes, whoever has access to this, has access to whatever is up. Above. So if you don't encrypt this thing, this is this you cannot be you cannot trust a bit. So this is horrible. This is dangerous and scary. Um, but just in case you still need more reasons, um, using HTTPS is safer by design because browsers are way more picky about that due to the way it's been designed. Um, and also I think this is important that we need to show empathy with users because we know better than them. And you know that people reuse passwords and emails and things like that. So if due to their ignorance, they're putting their, like, kind of like putting their data uh, under risk, we should know a bit better and try to help them avoid that kind of thing. So at least just encrypt our forms and that kind of thing so that no personal details are transmitted and encrypted over the network. Also, as I say, this is the thing that interests me. The newer JavaScript APIs only work with HTTPS. So if I want to keep doing cool stuff, I need to move to HTTPS. So this is something that is forcing me to do that. And even newer protocols also will only work over HTTPS. So if you want to be faster and la 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 la, you need to HTTPS. And also browsers are getting really serious. Like you're going to have like huge errors and like warnings and things because since users don't care, we need to do something because this is really important. Keeping users safe is serious business. Um, so in practice, um, more diagrams. Uh, I am the user, I want to visit example.com. And example.com tells me, hi, I am using this certificate and it's being issued by mega auth. And the browser is like, mega what? Who issued this thing? Ah, it was mega auth. Who issued this thing? This is very true, okay. Who <laughs> issued this thing? So we're kind of like following up all this chain of certificates and this is following the chain of trust. This is how we validate that this certificate is okay, that it's actually a valid certificate. And at some point, because this has to end at some point, we end up in this super root certificate. And it turns out that browsers have a list of root certificates installed in, their, um, in the browser. So you can do this um, lookup really quickly. Um, so at some point, we determine that this certificate is totally valid, so we can connect. And then the browser continues, and la 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 la, we get example.com, and we're Happy, when things go wrong, you get things like this. This connection is not secure, this is a terrible thing, la 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 la. If you look at the details, you can see that this is like happy hacker fake. This is not like a proper certificate. Obviously, normal users are not going to enter into the, like, who's going to check a fingerprint? No one. Um, so if things go great, you get access to the website that you intended and it's all cool. So how do you get a certificate? And this is where things get interesting. Normally, you would go to a traditional certificate authority, and so you generate a file in your command line using OpenSSL, you sign up in their system that's registering for us a website, upload the file, fill in forms, wait for some post or something, like HMRC do something, like they send you a letter with some code, la la la. You maybe add some code in your web to prove that you own the website. Maybe you go back to the website and prove that all the data you got in the post is back. Maybe you pay, some money goes away. Um, and then you finally get a digital certificate, but this doesn't, doesn't end here because then you need to install this thing in the server. So you need to take the keys out and maybe in a year or so you have to repeat this whole thing again. So this is really <laughs> tedious and people end up just like using the same certificate authority forever because they don't want to deal with some other like uh, authority which is even worse. So this is the worst. And that's why I didn't do it before. I'm like, I'm not even bothering with all this thing. So with Let's Encrypt, which is the thing I guess you're here for, you install the client in your web server. 
you get a digital certificate for the domain using this client, which is an executable thing. You take the keys from the certificate, and you can also automatically renew uh, the certificates with the client, and that's it. <laughs> when, I, when I read it, I was like, that's not possible, there is magic somewhere, and there is magic. Um, and it takes ten, to 10 minutes, so it's pretty cool. Um, so it's amazing. Um, so what is this thing that is magically giving you certificate authorities? Well, it's, uh, it's giving certificates. It's a new certificate authority, like those traditional um, old school authorities. Um, but it prides itself on being free, automated and open, and I'll explain all of this. And it's also a community project, which is still by the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is like uh, advocates on defendants of um, digital rights in like, you know, like this cyber world, this kind of like web world. So the other cool thing is that it's trusted by all major browsers. So when you, follow, when you follow the chain of trust for certificates issued by Less Encrypt, they end up being accepted by all browsers. So you don't get that kind of like, this certificate is invalid. Where did you get this thing from? So how do you install this thing? Well, the cool thing is that there is lots of support for this. So you can, if you, ha if you have a um, distribution that supports that, you can just like APT get installed. <laughs> and you can also da do it from source, which is what I did, such so as like, clone the repository, and it uses Python. So the first time you install it, it will try to install dependencies and la 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 la, but it's like really, I think it's the most friction free Python thing I've ever used, which is a lot to say. <laughs> so once you have the thing installed, you just run something like this that says, hi, let's encrypt, give me a certificate. Um, the web, using the web method to Using the web root method, using my web root path, which is example.com slash public HTML, this is what um, the website is serving. And then for the domain, example.com. And this is when magic happens. And after a while, magic happens. And then you get some files in here, which is like a directory for less encrypt. So you get this cert pen, private key, and then full chain. This is what you need to set up your um, website using HTTPS. So what's going on under the hood? Because this magic is weird. It's not black magic, we can decipher this. So the client connects to the Let's Encrypt server, and the Let's Encrypt server issues a challenge to our client. It says, okay, if you want to prove me that you control this domain, you should place some files somewhere, and somewhere is this um, public XML well-known ACME challenge directory. So there might be a number of strange files with generated stuff. I don't know if they also have to encrypt things or decipher or whatever, but things are placed there. And then the server tries to connect to our domain and make sure that these files are there and they are correct. So that proves that we are actually controlling the domain. If it's all okay, it gives us a certificate and we get the keys and we're done. <laughs> but this is really fast. Like you can't even like feel like you're waiting. It's really, really fast. And then if you're really curious and you don't trust me, you can go and look at this and you will see like the whole log, which is like really, it's really interesting to see how the things are going on, but you don't need to do that. Um, so once you have those files, and I'm using jeans and I'll explain why, um, you just need to point to those files from, the, you don't even need to copy them, you just need to point to the things that it generated and tell it like, just listen to the HTTPS port turn the SSL, which is encryption on, and bam, this is it. Um, if you don't trust it, you should probably verify that it's working. So engine text, test, maybe you need to sudo. And then if it looks okay, you just restart the server, and you are using HTTPS, which is really, really cool. Um, but don't get too excited yet, because these certificates are only issued for 90 days. So why 90 days? So apparently it's more complicated to expire certificates than to issue certificates for a very short period of time. So the good thing is that you can renew them automatically as well with the same client. So it's kind of similar, but there is a small difference, which is that we are stopping our server and then starting that. The cool thing is that when I run Let's Encrypt Auto Renew, it's going to renew all the domains that I have in this server. So that's really, I mean, it's annoying that you have to stop the server, but in contrast, I don't need to write any bash script to go domain pair domain and like issue the renew thing. So it's really fast. Um, I like simple things. So it re renews everything and then it's cool. And, and the reason why we're stopping the server is because we need to free port 80 so that the client 
can like start a temporary web server that is going to be serving those challenge um, that the client, like the server is uh, issuing us. So the files, it's the same thing that we have when issuing, but it's like we need a temporary server for this. And when we finish, everything is done, this temporary server is uh, stopped and we can start our server again. And even if we're serving HTTPS <laughs> content, we still, it's a recommended idea to have a um, server listening in HTTP so we can redirect all requests from HTTP to HTTPS. So this is minor, like it doesn't really bother me. <laughs> but I know it looks complicated and it's slightly complicated, but it's probably, I don't know, maybe there's a better way to do this thing, but I like things that I understand. Um, so if I find a better solution, I will tell everyone, but so far I'm using this. So the other thing you cannot rely on is on to remember to do this thing, because obviously you're going to forget to renew certificates. So the best thing is to automate this. So make you, I suggest you make a script called renew, listen script, and then this is as simple as you can get. You need the full path, uh, stop the server, renew, start the server, and run it, um, so you edit the uh, cron tab and then write something like this like every day at 5 a.m. My services, my websites tend to be really busy for like Europe and America times, but not too much for Asia, so 5 a.m. is a pretty good time for me. <laughs> it depends on you. Um, but yeah, this is, this is my setup and it's working and my websites have been HTTPS for a while and no one has told me, oh, I can't access your website. So that's cool. There are limits, it's not perfect, it's single tier. Um, there are some red limits, like you can register more than 500 registrations per hour, but I think no one in this room is going to have this issue. Um, it might be an issue for places like WordPress.com, they're trying to use Let's Encrypt, well, they're using Let's Encrypt for encrypting domains hosted in, in WordPress.com, but I think for us, it should be okay. Um, the other issue, the, the biggest issue I found is that it's, you cannot, try this thing without your server being accessible. So you cannot try things local host like before. You have to have like a slice or something, digital ocean or whatever you prefer to be reachable so the server can contact you. And also right now we can only issue certificates for web. So you cannot um, encrypt chat or mail or whatever, but it might change in the future. So are there issue setups? Because what I told you was kind of like manual. Yes, <laughs> there is an Apache plugin. This is officially supported and they recommend that thing if you're using Apache, but I'm not because it's too slow for me. Um, there is this plugin that was created six months ago in GitHub. I haven't seen any change. They promised to be able to do all this setup using the, the WordPress CLI, but I, haven't, I keep checking that to see if there is any progress, but nothing's happening, so maybe in the future. Um, there are web servers that have this thing built in, so you can get from zero to encrypted in 28 seconds. And also hosting companies are implementing this for you, like DreamHost, I think, are going to implement that. So you just go to the panel, control panel and say, encrypt, and it just like, poof, poof, encrypts for you. And WordPress.com, I think, as for last Friday, they are encrypting domains hosted in WordPress.com. So you can still get the benefits of Let's Encrypt, even if you don't want to do the manual way, which is what I'll show you. And it's actually the minimum thing you could probably, like this is like the hardcore thing you could do. So can we now get excited? No, <laughs> not yet. Um, because the basic HTTP setup is also, can be vulnerable. So the issue is that there are people using other protocols and ciphers and other defaults might be also dangerous. And so SSL, which is the first protocol for encryption, has been proved insecure. So then, like, I don't know if you heard about Poodle, this was a huge attack that they found. So the problem is that like servers like engines or nginx keep using SSL as the default and they didn't accept the pull request to change that to TLS first. So they said that it's fine and like really um, improbable that this might happen. So SSL is not safe. <laughs> so the recommendation is to use TLS, which is safer. And also you should reverse the protocol, um, use the newer version of the protocol first because it's safer. So, or, or maybe just don't offer SSL at all. So for example, if you have this default, which is what engines, Nginx does by default, SSL W3, la la la, remove this and reverse this. So this goes first and this kind of like gets in the same place. So this should be safer. And when a browser connects to your server, it's going to say, hi, how can I encrypt this thing? And 
the server would say, I offered you this and this and this. It's kind of like the menu. And then you, the browser would say, OK, I can do this thing. OK, I'll take this. So that's cool. The problem is that other clients might not be able to do any of these new things. So you need to be aware of that. And same, like you have a protocol, but the thing that actually encrypts thing is the cipher. And all those ciphers can be broken as well. <laughs> so you don't want to offer encryption with those, because it's kind of like equivalent to not having any cipher at all. But which ones to choose? Because you've seen the protocol names are kind of like more or less intelligible, but the ciphers, <laughs> like, should I use ECD, AS256, GC, or should I use ECD, I don't know. I have no idea. So my suggestion is you trust the experts. Um, the security people at Mozilla, who are way more paranoid than I am, have created this generator, which is pretty cool because you can say, I'm using Apache and I am kind of intermediate, so I could just enable this, la la la, and it will generate this thing for you. And then also, we'll tell you which is the oldest client that can connect. So, I mean, even the oldest is Firefox <laughs> 1. This is 2004. If you're still using that thing, uh, wow. <laughs> um, but still, um, Android 2.3 was kind of like, mm, and there are still a few um, people using that. So. That way you can be sure. And the cipher is like a huge block that you cannot see here because it's outside of this. But it's like a huge block of ciphers. It's very strange and very long. So yeah, this is pretty fancy. And also in client level security, you should totally enable strict transport security because this says the browser be really strict and demanding. Um, so once you visit a website that has HTTPS, the browser will say, I'm not going to take anything less than HTTPS from, the from this website. So even if you accidentally provide something like HTTP domain, the browser will say, no, I am deserving something better than this. So I'm going to request HTTPS. So even if you forgot to update your, site, your website, it will just ensure that everything is using HTTPS. And also, if the certificate can't be trusted, it will be like, no way. This is not, you're not tricking me. So for example, if you connect to a network and then you go to some other network, which is not like really secure and someone's trying to mine in the middle you, by showing a fake certificate, the browser will be like, you are not going to trick me, and I'm not going to let you connect to this. So it's safer. And so everything is ruined. You are safe. This is cool. So you, you just add this header to the um, server. Uh, don't worry about copying things. I will just, I have like a series of blocks where everything is spread, explained and everything. So you should be able to get all of this. So, and there are even more things. <laughs> like, there is way more things you can do to harden a server configuration. And this is totally overwhelming. It's a lot, and it is a lot for sure. So, the cool thing is that there are services that let you test these configurations. Um, there is this SSL, SSL labs, SSL test. And then Mozilla has another thing, which is kind of like a command line thing you can run in your server, sorry, in your, from your command line. And you point it to a server and it will tell you this is good, this isn't good. I really like the SSL test because it gives you ratings. <laughs> so the first time I ran this thing, I was like, oh, I'm going to be amazing. This is using less than I just got a C. I was vulnerable to this attack. I was using this weak thing. So this is, wow, no, that <laughs> cool. But actually, this generates like a huge long list of recommendations. So I follow them. And then I got A+. Plus. So this is really cool. Um, there are also lots of guides and tutorials because obviously geeks want people to be safe. So there is like a whole list of guidelines and ways of having like a very safe key and la la la. I don't know, there are many tutorials. Um, and you can keep looking. And so, yeah, WordPress considerations because we're in a work camp, I guess. Um, so the truth is that WordPress is pretty normal, which is good. I like normal. I don't like exceptions. So it pretty much works fine once you start using less and create, which is super cool. I just found a couple of minor details. The admin uses iframes for showing plugin details. So it kind of like goes to WordPress.org, gets the details, and then serves that with an iframe, which is served from your own website. So if you try to use this X frame option, which is one of the extra things you can do to harden, this option makes the browser say, I don't want this thing to be embedded in other domains or in iframes or whatever. So if you use this thing, you're kind of like denying yourself from showing the details from the plugins. So my recommendation is you just use same origin. So you're still allowing your site to be framed in your domain. So that's good. But if you don't want to allow even that, 
you can just keep using the line it's like super secure. Um, you, when you move to uh, HTTPS, you need to update those things, like the address and site address URLs, because some plugins use the constant, the W plugin URL, and that, like for pointing to CSS or JavaScript, so if you don't update that, they will still use HTTP, and you will get a big content warning from the web, from the web browser. And also, if you use super cache, empty the cache. <laughs> Otherwise, you get like all files like using HTTP and pointing to the resources. So that's not cool. Um, and this is the most horrible things I found with WordPress, which I think is pretty good for just like this huge change on protocols and things. And once you have HTTPS and using WordPress, you have the privacy and integrity that I mentioned before. <laughs> you have safe logins, so your 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 form is not going to be transmitted um, on the plane. And again, people are not going to know what your users are accessing, so that's pretty cool. And if you run ads, you keep your revenue for you. And here's this little thingy, unless your computer, your visitor's computer are infected with malware or whatever, so no one's safe, actually. Um, so what API features that you can access with this? This, 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 this. My colleague who's here has done all these plugins, so you can have access to all these cool things which are only available with HTTPS. Um, we are not doing this thing, but suppose you can do this thing now. Um, and in the future, background sync and la la la. And cool things is that everything about less encrypt is open source, which means that we are kind of like um, trust them better than all certificate authorities. If you don't like the client, you can use our clients, or you maybe even write your own client using the protocol, which is open and standardized as well. And maybe in the future, certificate issues might want to use the protocol to. Um, to let you get certificates, so you can still use the same client, and it's easier. Um, some numbers. In 2014, like they opened the beta in September, 2014, no, December of 2015, they were the fourth certificate issued worldwide. <laughs> and in March, they had issued one million certificates. And the coolest thing is that many of those websites hadn't been using any kind of security at all before that. So that's really cool. Um, secure all the things, and oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I've got this thing where you can get all the, all the materials that I've like, rushed through. And um, yeah, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, as always, we have uh, 10 minutes for questions. Um, so stick your hand up. You'll get a mic. Speak into the mic. Hello. Hi. Um, a slight multi-part question. So um, if you would go back to where you were talking about certificates and you've got the stack and levels, um, my understanding is if you've got a certificate, it's um, the trust comes from the certificate authority, which is where you got the certificate from, correct? Mm -hmm. And it's important that there are only a handful of certificate authorities and that they are secure and trusted. Well, it's important they are trusted. I don't know. So about the if, numbers. So as a side, leading on to something else, if one of those certificate authorities was compromised and what what's that's quite bad, isn't it? That could they could do all sorts of terrible and horrible things. Yeah. Yeah. So but I would in this case I from the past record I imagine those certificate authorities are quite secure. But if you can put your hands up, if you're on the university Wi-Fi, on the MetNet Wi-Fi network, just if you've logged in in the last two days on your phone or your device. And when you logged in, did you get a certificate security warning? And who pressed trust? So that certificate is self-signed from the university. And by clicking trust, you trust that you trust any certificates that they hand out. So that means basically that you you basically trust the university isn't doing anything terrible. And if something terrible happened to a certificate authority and you know terrible things could happen, and you're basically trusting that isn't happening in this place on this network, that they're not gonna hand out other certificates and that they're not gonna do other things. There's, uh, in India, there was a lot of controversy over universities that tried to do similar things. They tried to force you to install certificates so that they could see exactly what you were browsing and what you were looking at, so that they would be sure that their students weren't 
looking up inappropriate materials and that they could snoop on all of their private communications by replacing official certificates with their own. And then, of course, because it was a requirement to be a student, that would be an option. So when you're connecting to Wi-Fi networks, always be wary. I've noticed sometimes on Macs, it prompts you, sometimes it doesn't, but the warning's there if you look for it, but it's not obvious and it's not something that people are told. So just be very mindful of that. If you're, um, so if you're on it now, I would say that um, I wouldn't think that the university is trying to do anything terrible, but to be mindful, um, if you're on an Apple device, usually you can go into general under settings and profile configuration, and you can usually see the list of what's been added there in the past. So, just a note. Just to, con I think, answer your question, if that was a question. <laughs> um, when certificate authorities are like, I don't know what you actually were going to. Anyway, browsers invalidate their certificates. That happened with some authority a couple of years ago. So if you connect to a website which is using that kind of certificates, the browser will say this certificate is invalid. So users should be fine just in case. <laughs> there is ways of doing that. Yeah. Any other questions? I, I was just wondering if you could maybe share your experience with the have you had any experience with using Cloudflare flexible SSL? Do you think I haven't really, but I found well, I was reading all these things. Uh, you can duplicate the certificate that you issue from uh, Desencrypt, so you can upload the keys to Cloudflare. So you can still use self well, self generated or less encrypted certificates with Cloudflare or other CNNs, CDNs. But I, do, I don't use CDNs because I'm kind of like a small user. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, it, what is the prevention to stop someone who is in a situation of doing a man-in-the-middle attack from automatically regenerating a new certificate so that when a visitor comes to your website, they will get a valid um, trusted cannot, certificate? It cannot be trusted. It cannot Why not? Because if they're doing a man-in-the-middle attack, they're sat between your server and the internet, so therefore they can see all requests coming into your domain because that will be passing through them. So if the browser already visited your website and you have strict transport security... Yes, so they go to example.com, it, it goes to your IP address. If they sit in front of your IP address, they will fail at that point, but if then they request, they go to Let's Encrypt and say, I want a certificate for example.com, Let's Encrypt gives them a new certificate. Do they have access to Let's example.com? Yes, because they're sat in front of your IP address. They've, Can they've they into your reach network. that place? Because so? they can, can they reach the place? I mean, man in the middle means that someone is in my network. Um, so they have to be in the same network that Let's Encrypt is, so they can no, fake it? No, they have to be in the same network as you. Well, but bad luck. Isn't it uh, a SSL certificate when, when we refresh the new one? Uh, doesn't it require public and private key authentication? That, that's what I'm, yeah. I'm wanting to know. How, how do you prove? The, the person requesting a refresh on a certificate is the original person that asked for that certificate and not someone else coming along and saying, I want to refresh on this, but not actually being the original site. I'm not quite sure. You're running this thing in the same server, so it has to be, it's a connection between the server, um, like b between your web server and the less encrypted server. So if something's happening in between, yeah. It's always a person that controls this, the domain. So uh, it's, if it's a man in the middle, someone sat on that network, sniffing your traffic going through, whilst oh. it's encrypted, that's fine. Uh, but if no. they can then fake... Maybe you just leave IT. <laughs> I'm not an less encrypted uh, super expert, so I think you should ask that thing in the forums if you're curious about that. Uh, hi. Um, the reason the renew process is so different is because part of the renew process is serving up your original SSL certificate. Um, so if you have a man in the middle attack for the renew process, they cannot sign as if they were you. So your request goes out, renew the certificates, they come back, get man in the middle, and they're going to give you a new certificate, but the man in the middle still can't actually sign as you originally. That's not meaning that the man in the middle initiates a new request. Yes, a new, a renewal request. No, a fresh request. If, example, but if you initial a fresh request, and you've already done a request in the past, let's equip is, is Let's Encrypt isn't going to serve you a new certificate because you already have one. Right, so if you lose your certificate, you've got 90 days where you can get a new certificate for your domain. 
possibly. <laughs> I, I, I know that for, um, you can't request another one when you still have one, and renewing it is difficult, slightly more difficult because of that exact scenario. But you shouldn't be able to get man in the middle during a renewal, and a man in the middle shouldn't be able to renew because they need your original certificate to sign for the renewal. It's, it's like public private key, you know, yeah. over a SSH authentication. They, you know, you're man, man in the middle, but even though you make a fake request, uh, you're not going to renew it because you don't have the original you know, yeah, private sure, key, but some individual. If, if you could generate one for that domain and claim that you now own it, it would be I'm not 100% sure yeah. on that, but possibly not. Because of mine during the process, it's going to visit the original domain and challenge it with something. So the man in the middle would need full control of the domain at that point. We're a little tight on time, um, so I think this would be a good discussion for after the talk. Um, we've got time for a final question, um, so stick up your hand and let's have it. Um, it's not really a question, it's more of a comment. There are... Um, I'd specifically ask for a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, John make Blackburn is working really heavily to make uh, core support HTTPS. There's a bunch of weird edge cases with it. Have you heard about his plugin? Mm. <laughs> no. I think we've got room for one more question um, <laughs> before we finish. If there are any. If there aren't, we'll finish. Just a comment, not a question. <laughs> mm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think earlier on, uh, this gentleman mentioned about the university. I think the university may have issued their own certificate, you know, your own, you can offer, but I think when we're all using public Wi-Fi, I think it's highly advisable. To, you can get your own VPN connections for very, very cheap, four or five dollars. So I w if anybody's really conscious about that, using open Wi-Fi networks, just get your own server, for, uh, open VPN server. But that's good. You're getting paranoid. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, um, a fantastic talk, I'm sure you'll all agree. Um, so let's give a round of applause.